Hey, hi, hi, Christina. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Steve? Great. I'm fine. Are uh, everybody enjoying their stay at home? <laughs> making the best of it. We've been keeping busy and I've been fortunate to have some commissions to work on. So we're not twiddling our thumbs. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah. I know you, you've had, you've actually had some success staying home with new commissions, right? Yeah, we do feel lucky that our business is an at home based uh, company. So we've been able to, to work on artwork and we've even been doing a few projects too, just for fun and some commissions as well. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, I just want to say this, uh, just for, for, for the audience that we, that, that we expect to see this, uh, that we're here today with Christina Toomey, a uh, self-made artist, I would say. And I, I would say that it's, a, it's, been a, it's a rocket career. <laughs> <laughs> the rise has been quick. Um, and she's had tremendous success as an artist, uh, both in print and galleries with uh, interior designers. Um, and with uh, commissions, I mean, a, a really decent um, private commission, uh, gr a group of people who are commissioning your work, which is wonderful. And, uh, you know, any artist who's in the business understands that, you know, anytime you can, you can do that and, 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 and start to build a brand and start to actually earn money from, from, the, um, from your labor, that's a positive thing. <laughs> yeah, we agree completely. So we, we know how many artists are not doing well right now. This is a very bad time for the for artists in general because people are typically are not buying, um, and they um, and artists are, are. I mean, many artists can't even go to their studios. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess. Um, but it's great we're here today and we can talk about this and we can we can kind of um, uh, look at what you're doing and seeing how see how you do that and even maybe give some advice to artists who are out there who are now contemplating what they can do to actually get out there and brand themselves in a better way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So my first one is, uh, let's start, let's start with the beginning. Um, what was your inspiration and where did this all begin to become the, uh, a full-time artist? That's a great question. My husband, Bobby is a producer and we were living in Minnesota. He ended up getting a job opportunity out in Los Angeles and we moved into our new home. It was a cute little spot, uh, which actually happened to be right behind a Joanne Fabrics. And so one day I was looking around the house, we had empty walls everywhere. And we were just getting started. LA is really expensive. We didn't have a huge budget for decorating our house. So I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna pop over to the Joanne Fabrics and uh, buy some paint brushes and canvases and try and give it a whirl. And I was looking at Pinterest all day, just seeing so many beautiful paintings, thinking, you know, I'm gonna give my hand at, at trying something. And so I did. Bobby happened to be at work. He ended up coming home after I'd whipped out two different pieces and actually was pretty surprised at how good they looked. And so was I, I was thrilled. So after that, I just started collecting more canvases and trying new things. And pretty soon our entire house was decorated with my art. That's great. That's yeah. Wonderful. Well, listen, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, it's you're, you're a self-taught artist, correct? Yes, correct. That's wonderful. I mean, there's, there are, would you consider yourself an outsider artist or, or in, in that vein of, of the art world? Or do you think basically you're just, just a self-taught painter and that you've moved on? You know, I think a lot of artists these days are self-taught. And when you say self-taught, I think, you know, that's a hard thing to say. It's not like I just did it myself. I didn't have any inspiration. I mean, I'm constantly looking at all of the art in the world, uh, from resin artists to acrylic to texture to installation artists. And uh, I mean, the, the opportunities to learn is endless. And I think, too, with the social media revolution, just looking at YouTube videos and tutorials, um, everybody's teaching everybody these days. So we're like sponges, just absorbing information and new techniques and color combos. And it's just a really fun way to learn. Very different from the past, I think. I, I would agree. And I think that, you know, I went to art school, but I, I have to say that my, my education began after art school. Sure. Um, you know, um, I, I mean, there are good things I learned in art school, but I, nothing that I couldn't have gotten elsewhere. And I have to say that, uh, you know, yes, you're right. The web is, web, the, the internet is the school. Uh, you can find everything you need to know on the web. And if you're paying attention, you can, you can develop, you can develop, uh, you know, a, um, an aesthetic for what you like. Yeah, you really can. That, can. that can feed right into your, to a practice, which is what's happened to you. Yeah. And I say that uh, the work you've developed, um, 
the uh, skill sets you bring to your work are, are really quite astounding. They're beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, and obviously, it takes a lot of effort and time to do the work that you're, that you're making right now. So, you know, right now, you, you have a booming studio practice. I, I, would, I would call it a booming studio practice. Yes. Uh, you know, you, yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're out there in the media. You've gotten a great deal of coverage. And I'm going to mention the, the, the current, the, the most current, nice, really wonderful magazine piece you got was in Artful Living. I thought there was a great article, uh, beautifully put together, nice photos, uh, which really gave you a, a really great promotional boost. Yeah, uh, we were so fortunate about this uh, opportunity. We have a great partnership with Martha O'Hara Interiors in Minneapolis and Kate O'Hara, uh, who is the CEO and creative officer of their company, introduced us to Frank Ropers, uh, who runs the editorial team at Artful Living. And he really enjoyed looking at our capabilities and our work and suggested that his writer that's based in Los Angeles come over to our house and interview us. So yeah, we were just so impressed with Marguerite's writing and, and the whole team at Artful Living was just fantastic. And again, we're just so grateful. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's hard to get a writer or you know, certainly a curator, but definitely a writer to come to your house and talk to you. Yeah, yeah. Usually you have, to, you have to write the article yourself and turn it in. <laughs> I know. I felt so special that day. We had such a fun time just sitting around. Uh, she got to meet our dog, Kazan, who was very friendly. And, but yeah, just such a cool experience yeah. for us. It's a, it's a really fantastic article. Anybody out there who gets art for a living, and I know a lot of people do, I would definitely recommend you take a look at the article and um, uh, read about uh, Christina's work and uh, take a look at the photos and uh, check it out. It's wonderful. Now that you've, you, you've kind of done a really good job of branding yourself and, and you're, you're very good at getting media attention, can you, could you just elaborate a little bit about how you go about doing that? How, how, what skill sets have you from your previous, from previous life in, in the workforce and the previous kinds of jobs you've had, how that's prepared you to do, not only to make art, but to actually become, sell yourself and brand yourself? Uh, my career experience, I was working for a consumer packaged goods company out of Fort Lauderdale and I was in national sales and then also did quite a bit of marketing. And it was just really important for me as a sales representative to travel, to go face to face and meet the clients that I was working with and establish really strong relationships. I think that's been our key success is really getting to know our customer base uh, and establishing relationships. So there's a lot of commitment on both ends to deliver a fantastic product and an experience. It's not just about sending a piece of art across the country. As far as developing press relationships, it's the same thing. I mean, just introducing ourselves on a personal level instead of expecting it to come to us. We've been, really been reaching out to people, introducing our work, and, you know, not everything's a home run. We sometimes don't hear from people and, and sometimes we get no's, but uh, I think you have to grow a really thick skin and expect that. And the ones that do say yes, the ones that do want to foster your career with you, um, you know, we call it the low hanging fruit. You continue to nurture those relationships and then blossom from there. You know, I mean, I think it, I think a lot of people think it's it's uh, it's rocket science, but it's uh, it's actually more about uh, work and being on task and trying to reach out to people and connect with them. Yeah, absolutely. And we also really decided that we were going to go after the the high end fine art market too. And and you can't service everybody. I think that's an important message for artists. You have to figure out who your target audience is for your work. And, and work within that realm. Of course, we're always trying to diversify our lines and come up with new pieces, you know, in furniture and sculpture with Driftwood Amethyst and a few other, other lines uh, that we're gonna come out with probably in the next year. But we do really wanna hone in on that audience. And like I said, we're not everything to everybody. You just can't be. True, and so you're, you're really gone after the home interiors market. I would say that, that I mean, from what the, from the ads that I, or rather, excuse me, the articles and the press you have is really aimed at that market. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and definitely, obviously, I think uh, Artful Living is, is probably uh, uh, top, top of the line in that respect. Yes, definitely. Uh, that's, what, that's what their market is. I mean, the, um, they're, they're connected to Sotheby's, and soft pieces in the, in the home market, home building and home selling market. 
which is, sure. which, which is a great marketplace. And that's where art typically goes, people's homes. Yep, definitely. Um, what would you, what would you, I mean, let me, it's true, you know, you, you're right about one thing, you, you know, artists, you, you need to be focused on some, on one area of the, the market where the area, the area where you think your work is going to fit, whether it's corporate or it's uh, home interiors or it's small offices, you need to pick, pick and choose so that you're not spread too thin. I think that's one of the biggest problems artists face is they get, they get, it can be very, it can be very daunting to choose a place to go and to uh, focus on that and not get distracted. Definitely. I mean, we've really tried to expand into the Hollywood production world as well. Uh, my husband, Bobby, had a connection from years ago who ended up reaching out to us about the set of Ballers and ended up leasing two pieces for Ballers and then purchased another one. And that was really an eye-opening experience. But it really it got my excitement up about really, I mean, we live in Los Angeles, why not produce art for Hollywood sets? So after we had a great experience with the set of Ballers, we just secured placement with a huge show on Apple TV. We're not able to disclose at this point which one it is, but uh, our biggest piece, Glacier, which is an eight foot by four foot resin artwork, is going to be in an A-list celebrity home. Although now with COVID-19 uh, halting everything, you know, I'm not really quite sure when they're gonna be able to get back into the production. And we were hoping the show would launch in the fall, but you know, again, that's yet to be determined, so. Oh, yeah, that's, that's great. I, I, yeah, I think that's a great, that's a wonderful, that's great. But you know, I, I, how would, let's say an artist wanted to, um, to uh, lease their work in Hollywood. Can you tell them wh wh where to start, where they would go? Sure. Again, it's all about relationships. There are certain websites where you can go find different uh, set designers, email addresses. Uh, we've done that direct contact experience and then they also have production houses where they literally have warehouses that are filled with props, furniture. Uh, so we've reached out to a few of those. We've just secured a really strong partnership with one of them in Los Angeles that primarily focuses on artwork. Uh, the only issue we run into, again, as you had mentioned, is our artwork takes a lot of time and also money to create. And so um, sometimes going through a second party to split the, the cost of a rental, which is a reduced rate, obviously, from a purchase price, uh, can be a little bit challenging. So we're trying to figure out ways to produce not our most expensive pieces, but still have beautiful work out there on the sets. That's another one. So basically, you, you, you're, so basically what you're, you are doing is you're creating a company and with a diverse, I mean, really you're creating an art company. Yes. That is, that is, yours, that is based on your, your artwork style, but you're looking at actually producing multiple works as a company, but multiple styles of work and also multiple multiple media styles of media. So that you know you're building a building a company. That's something a lot of artists don't actually re see their work or see their studio practice as a product. They mm -hmm. don't look at it as a product, and they don't understand. They don't seem to um, handle their their studio practice as a business and company. Um, that they that they're there to manage and to 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 promote yeah and actually that was one of the challenges that i had to face as an artist going from producing stuff for my own house and for friends and i started my business selling on etsy selling paintings for 200 300 dollars but anybody sure. that knows about about art supplies when you're starting to buy the expensive canvases that are required for fine art the paints the mediums uh resin for example it's not cheap. And so if you're even selling a piece for 500 or a thousand dollars, you're really not making much money, especially when you break down the hours invested in creating the artwork. Uh, and so I think that's a really important message, uh, trying to help people turn their hobby art business into an actual business, which my husband had to sit me down when I said I wanted to do this full time and quit my, you know, really well paying job it's like you're not running a business you're running a hobby because while you're selling artwork for a thousand dollars you're basically breaking even so how do you turn this into a profitable business and like the biggest message is really believing in your work and believing in yourself and convincing others to believe in investing in your work too so bobby was really the one that helped coach me to say hey our worth 
is this. People will pay this to have your beautiful paintings in their homes. And it's enabled us to grow this company in a business way and become profitable. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, just, just, to, just to add on to that, you know, basically, um, I, I had years of talking to artists about the, their, um, what exactly is profit mm -hmm. um, and what is, and how, how to make, how to profit from your work. And uh, looking at material, looking at the cost of materials, their, over, their, their overhead, the cost of their overhead, mm -hmm. um, and their hourly, what, the, what is it they pay themselves hourly? Because you, you know, your profit is not necessarily what you sell the artwork for. <laughs> you have to subtract all the other things that, that are actually cost you to make that. And I think that's a, that's a, a big problem with, um, with studio practices in general. Is that they're, they're not actually uh, doing, running books, essentially. Make, keeping track of everything that they spend and everything that they make and making sure that when it comes down to the bottom line, there is a profit at the end of that. Absolutely, it's important. Yeah, that's really important. So here's another question for you. This goes back to your to to you yourself. Um, you started out as a painter, right? Yes. Right. So you're painting on canvases. What led you to 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 um, to uh, resin arts? Again, looking at social media, I saw some artists out there. Mitch Goebbels, one of them. Um, most people that dabble in resin know his name. And I just saw this work, and I was mesmerized. And also intimidating, uh, intimidated because if you haven't worked with a medium and you haven't gone to art school and experienced that in class, uh, you really have to again be self-taught. And right when I started learning resin, I don't recall there being too many how-to videos, so it was really just, hey, I'm going to run to the store and buy this, and we're going to give it a try. And mm -hmm right away I was hooked and I haven't really looked back. I still do some canvas work and again like I mentioned uh, we're really getting into furniture and some other lines uh, down the road but resin's been my bread and butter and I just love experimenting with it and even today I learn new things every single time we're working on an artwork uh, so that's kind of an exciting thing for me too. So tell us, let's talk about a little bit more about uh, actually how you um the process by which you actually build the layers and what what the paints and uh, you say you're using markers, paints, and alcohol-based inks. Talk a little bit about how you're working with that and how that how you apply that to layers and what time it takes to for drying time and then and then what the next layer is and how you kind of plan that out. How do you how do you make that work together? So all of my resin pieces have a multitude of layers. And the reason why I like doing that is because when you look at a piece up close, and unfortunately photography on our website, even though if it's a great picture, it just doesn't do the piece justice. You really have to see the work in person. And I can go anywhere from five layers, 15. Uh, right now we're even creating a 100% resin piece. So the depth of it is just gonna be insane. We do a lot of translucent layers that have intermittent spots of like you had mentioned, pigments or alcohol inks, acrylic paints. Uh, so when you're looking into it, the piece just comes alive. And it's just a fun process for me. I love being able to see my top layer and then look down and think about each individual layer that I did too, because they're all different artworks in and of itself. Yeah, it's like a sandwich. <laughs> like a sandwich, exactly. One of those big ones you get at the New York delis that are stacked highly. <laughs> I've seen quite a bit of resin work in my in in my years of, of being a gallerist, and I I, I have to say I, I've always been fascinated by resin uh, because of because of the dimensional depth you get with resin, even if it's just poured on top of a painting. Yeah, it, really, it brings another dimension to the work, um, and it put it put it punches up color because it actually deepens color. Yes, you, it does. Uh, is the resin when you're using all this resin and you're I know you're working in a small space. Uh, is it poisonous? Is that something that's toxic for you? That's the that's the big debate that all resin artists have. Uh, you know, we take a close look at the MSDS sheets. This, uh, sorry, a little tickle in my throat. Material data and safety sheets. Every company that's a chemical manufacturer has to have a record of all the raw materials that go into their products. And the, the products that we use, um, I actually just switched resin companies, which 
you know, I always use the best resins. Originally I was using art resin and then I got in contact with mass epoxy and, uh, the, the director of sales page sent us some samples there. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting this to be a switch for me, but after getting my hands on the resin and using it, I absolutely loved uh, just how I was able to accomplish so many more things with the product. Um, so that's one thing to know too. Not all resins are the same. We've also been sent, and I'm not gonna name names because I don't wanna downplay any resins, but we've received a lot of samples from other companies that I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole on my art projects. Um, the quality ranges drastically. And of course, because we're, we're targeting that fine, high-end art market, I always want the best. So the Mass Epoxy Resin has been my number one pick um, of all of the ones that I've tried. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's great. You know, yeah, I've, I've actually heard the same thing that uh, from artists who use, a, who use a, a resins, uh, that the resins can be uh, cloudy, mm -hmm. they can be, they cannot cure, you can have all kinds of problems. Resin is a resin is a variable product. Absolutely. Tricky. Temperature plays a big role. You have to have a warm room. To be all of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you do you do you just have one more question about the, the the process itself? Do you do you, is there anything you use to dry the resin more quickly? Do you, can you speed the process up in any way or it, to kind of minimize time? Sure. Uh, UV light cures resin quickly, although we don't have a UV light installed in our art room. The heat uh, speeds up that process too. If you actually torch or use the heat gun, you can notice that the resin will start curing pretty quickly. Um, does but that, a lot of times- Does that create cracks in the resin? Does that, is that a problem uh, when you try to dry it too quickly? Does it create- uh, so with my artwork, I don't have issues with cracking on my resin, but when we work on our resin and teak furniture line and you're doing a deep pour, there's, uh, there's a lot of issues with cracking in that, so you have to be very careful about uh, the yeah, depth. That's because you're combining two different materials. Uh, it's not necessarily that you're combining two different materials. Um, I just think it has to do with the depth of the, the pore and sometimes also the oxygen and water that might be trapped in the wood that's releasing into the resin and creating some issues there. Uh, but all of it's easy to fix. I mean, you just have to re-pour on top, sanding down and then re-pouring and sanding. And it's a huge process, you know, and the artwork is just the beginning of it. You know, the finishing work takes a tremendous amount of time. And fortunately I have my husband, Bobby, because I have major issues with my hands and actually part of why I transitioned over into resin was because it was a lot easier on my arms. Um, I believe it's carpal tunnel, but if I'm spray painting or using any sort of, you know, paintbrush for an extended period of time, the next couple days I'm completely numb and can't use my arms. So when it comes to the finishing work on resin, you have to sand down all of the nubs that basically the resin drops off the wood panel and creates these nubs and they harden. You have to remove all of those, which is very labor intensive. Uh, sometimes we sand down the entire piece and my pieces are huge. So that takes a tremendous amount of time. It's also highly annoying <laughs> listening to the sander all day. <laughs> talking about refinishing the sides. What's that? Talking about refinishing the sides. Uh, the sides, the bottom, sometimes even the top will sand down uh, and then put another layer on top. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's good. You know, I know an artist in the Twin Cities who actually, her very first works, she used the nubs, the, nub, the, the, the drips that came down off the top. Oh, okay. oh interesting. So, yeah, they're beautiful. I mean, they're gorgeous works. We had them in the gallery for a long time. Oh, um, cool. And now she does uh, countertops, you know, and, and a lot of other. She's also company, company-tizing her, her practice. Okay, but, um, So, in closing, what I'd like to say, as everyone is watching this, I really uh, would encourage you to go to our, uh, Christina's website, christinatoomeyart.com. Also, check us out, uh, check her out on Instagram, and uh, don't forget to check her out on Gallery Thirteen on Artsy.net. Um, please take a look; you'll be amazed at her work. It's gorgeous, even though uh, photographs, uh, images don't always uh, give you the depth, but you can see the amount of effort and amount of work that are in each piece. Uh, because the design is definitely there. It's gorgeous, beautifully done. Thank uh, you. And I, I, I also want to add, uh, we, we didn't talk about this, but uh, we didn't talk about what, what influences your work. 
Uh, nature, mostly. My husband and I are avid travelers. We love going around the state of California with our rescue dog. So we're very into camping. And on each trip, there's always special things that we'll find. I'll give you one example to tell a little story. But um, we were in this really neat place called Idlewild. It's in the mountains just by Palm Springs. And it's such a cool little town. If you're in California, you have to check this place out. The town mayor is actually a golden retriever. And there's just little, yeah, it's so cute. And he comes around to meet everybody. And we're huge dog people, obviously. Uh, there's little wineries and cafes, pubs, and some little shops and stuff. It's a very, very small town. Uh, not many people live up there. But anyway, uh, we were on a camping trip one year and they had this crystal mineral shop. And so we went in there, I'm very into crystals. And I saw this stone, uh, the Labradorite, and I was just blown away by how these green and blue hues were intertwined with this kind of like brownish line of veins. And I picked one up and I actually had had a piece in my studio that I couldn't figure out what to do with it. It was just stumping me. I put it aside. I wasn't going to work on it. And I saw this stone. I was like, oh my gosh, that piece is going to become this. So I got back to the studio and I mixed all of my turquoises and teals and some interference colors and did my vein uh, thing that I would say is one of my like favorite things to do in a lot of my pieces. And it was just a spectacular piece. It ended up being leased by HBO's Ballers and uh, then sold to one of our friends who found us through the internet uh, several years back. He actually has uh, I think purchased about four pieces from us, including four teak and resin bar stools. So he's become a great customer. Now he's actually starting to sell our artwork to some of his friends and other customers. So it's been a great relationship. Oh, anything, let's, let's say anything else we can add? Anything else we should talk about? You would like to add to the to the discussion? Gosh, I don't know. I'm just really looking forward to working with you two. And uh, thank you so much for this interview today. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad glad we had a chance to talk. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much, Steve. We'll do it again. Yeah, sounds good. Here you. All right.